This is our Sunday School lesson number six for January the 7th, 2018. Still from Unit 2, A Living Faith in God. And our lesson's title is Living Your Convictions. Our devotional reading is found in the number 56 of the book of Psalms. Our background scripture is Daniel 1. Our printed passage is Daniel 1, verses 8 through 21. And our key verse is Daniel 1 and 8. And I read it from the NIV. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for, per, for permission not to defile himself this way. Our lesson's aims are to explain the choice that Daniel and his companions faced and the outcome of the choice they made. Aspire to have the faith of Daniel when confronted with contradictory directives from different sources of authority and identify situations that call for the exercise of faith as Daniel and his companions exercise theirs. Our lesson today displays the commitment that Daniel and his three servants exercised and displayed in the face of opposition. Uh, this is quite appropriate with the timing of the year that we are in because this is the beginning uh, of our calendar year and we usually have a genuine or general practice during this time of the year where we have all types of nuances and different things, or uh, so-called different things, to try out. And uh, we make promises and uh, we declare certain uh, New Year resolutions, things that I'm going to do this year that I didn't do last year, or the year before that, or the one before that. And um, as we start out, with the greatest intentions of making these accomplishments and establishing these uh, new uh, experiences and activities in our lives. Uh, so that makes this lesson uh, quite appropriate for the setting. Now, we realize here that um, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, they were uh, in Jerusalem and they were from the house of Judah and uh, they were selected because they were wise, they were knowledgeable, they were considered to be the best and the brightest that Judah had. And uh, a lot of times uh, those outside of the house are looking into the house and they recognize, sometimes they recognize the value of certain individuals and their abilities uh, that others have become accustomed to. And others don't always see or appreciate or recognize the value of those that are gifted that are among us. And so therefore, the opposition though, those outside of the house, they recognize certain qualities and certain abilities, and then they siege the opportunity to use those abilities to their benefit so that they may prosper from the gifts that have been given uh, to those in the house of God. And this is the case, as it were, with Daniel and his three servants. And so 
what we find is, uh, and this kind of really focuses in on two uh, major characters, or I should say, should foc they focus in on two uh, major experiences or major incidents that we should focus some attention to. First off is, is that through Daniel 1 verses 8 through 14, we find that uh, Daniel and his servants are confronted by the prince of the eunuchs. And they are being propositioned that they would partake of the king's royal food and drink of the king's wine. And we know that these are delicacies and uh, these are the best that is being offered because the king and all of the king's royalty are partaking of this diet. Uh, and so one should somewhat be honored that uh, they have even been asked and been offered the chance to partake of the same food that the king and royalty are partaking of. But uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah already had a diet that was suitable to them. They had already witnessed and experienced the results of the diet they were already accustomed to. And even though the diet that they were being offered, I'm sure, had some overlays that uh, this is the finest of meats, uh, this is the best of wine, and a lot of times we are enticed uh, by adjectives to describe something that we inherently know or something that we find out from exposure from other people's uh, uh, diets or from other information that even with all of the attractive adjectives that are associated with that diet, the diet is not helpful. The diet is not healthy and it is not good for us. But in this case, regardless to all of the hoop and holler about this wonderful meal, Daniel and his servants decide that, no, we'll just stick with what we know. We will just uh, eat uh, these uh, little... Um, insignificant vegetables it says pulse but pulse is a word describing the substance of what they were eating and so they decided they would leave those t-bone steaks and those uh, ribeyes and and they would leave those pork chops and and they would leave those uh, medium well or medium or rare hamburgers uh, where the meat is still bleeding as we bite into it. But they decided that they would leave all of those mouth-watering meats alone and just stick to the vegetables. Now, I said earlier that this here is uh, a good lesson for the start of the year because a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, looking at our weight and uh, thinking about, okay, what can I do to lose a few pounds? And, you know, maybe I should cut back on this. Maybe I should cut back on that. But uh, I think when we look at this, um, a point that we want to bring out is, is that in America and throughout uh, other parts of the world, but since we're in America, our focus should be at home first. So in America, we realize that uh, we have a abundance of health issues here. 
Uh, we have health issues here in America that are not experienced in other parts of the world because other parts of the world are not on the same diet uh, on the same diet uh, that we practice here in America. And so one of the very significant things about the lesson is is the after effect which Hananiah, Michelle, Azariah, and Daniel displayed after sticking to the diet of water and vegetables. It was their outer appearance, the, the glow of their skin. Um, it was the overall appearance that they displayed after just 10 days of sticking to that diet. And so compared to the diet that was given to the others who partook of the king's royal meat and wine. Now, what I found very significant about this is, is that uh, this gets right back into uh, that God does not change. Uh, we're going to look at just three scriptures here uh, that I want to lift relative to our diet. Uh, but Genesis 1 and 29 and Ezekiel 47 and 12 and also Revelations 22 and 2. And when we talk about that we serve a God that does not change, doesn't change his mind, uh, sticks to the plan that he has established for his creatures and creation. And uh, we follow trends and so-called new information and um, there's a, a new fashion here. Uh, there's a, a new um, a diet over here and we become attracted to things. But uh, in the end, when we finish experimenting and then we've encountered, uh, encountered uh, these illnesses, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart conditions, uh, high blood pressure. And then the doctors usually tell us that uh, you need more fiber in your diet. You need to cut back on the meat. Let go of the sodium. Leave those salty foods out. Uh, cut back on fast food, processed foods. Uh, uh, put more vegetables and fruit into your diet. Drink more water. But I want us uh, to look at what was said from the beginning all the way through to the end. Here's what God determined would be best for his creatures. And it says, Genesis 1, 29. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you. It shall be for food. Ezekiel 47 and 12 along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Revelations the 22nd chapter and the second verse in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
So although a lot of nutrition or nutritionists and dietitians are explaining uh, to many in America to try and change the health issues and the diet that we've grown accustomed to. Now many are saying that, hey, you need to eat more vegetables. Uh, you need to have more fruit. But God said it in Genesis and about midway of the Bible in Ezekiel, he said it again. And then when we get into Revelations at the end where he's talking about the new paradise. Now, it's a new paradise, but the same thing that he said in Genesis in the beginning is the same thing that he's bringing into the new paradise. So when we say he knows the end before the beginning, he doesn't switch and, and sway and change and this, that and the other. But what I meant for my creation, I mean from the beginning all the way through to the end. Now, while we're still talking about the four Hebrews who stood their ground and maintained their commitment to their own customs, to their own uh, style or their own ways of eating, there, while we're looking at this, you know, beginning of this year here, while we're looking at... Uh, our diets and changes that we may be encountering or contemplating and thinking about making. There is a very helpful tool out which commemorates everything that God said in Genesis, Ezekiel, and Revelations. The title of it is called Forks Over Knives. It's an excellent DVD for anybody who's considering uh, some changes in their uh, food choices. Excellent DVD. You can probably just get it uh, on YouTube uh, and look at different excerpts of it. But it's again, the title is Forks Over Knives. It's an excellent uh, bit documentary bit of information concerning food illnesses and the issues we have with health concerns here in America. Now, I want to lift one other little thing and then uh, we'll be about done. Uh, that is the end results. At the end of the 10 days, they looked at the appearance of the four Hebrews and they saw a striking difference in how they appeared. They looked at the countenances of their face and looked and noticed that even uh, their weight, that they were more streamlined. It said that their appearance was fairer. Uh, but what, what I recognize here is, is that the emphasis on the scripture is based on the appearance that the four Hebrews displayed. Nothing is said about the appearance that the Babylonians displayed, which was confirmation to the Hebrews that we need to stick to our diet. Because look at the countenance and look at the appearance of those who are trying to tell us you should eat what we are eating. See, we don't, uh, it's not really, the emphasis is based upon the commitment that the four Hebrews made and how there was a striking difference in their end results and how they look compared to the others who took the king's food. But the Hebrews already had seen how the king's court looked. The Hebrews had already seen what their appearance was like, which was a reaffirmation that this is why we need to stick to our diet. Because look at what it's done to them. And if they can see the difference that we display, then surely we see the difference that they display. Now, we want to close uh, with this right here. 
Uh, and that is, is that from verses uh, 15 uh, to 21, I, I want to lift one other little point here. And that is the change in the four Hebrews names. Now, I know we're in a time right now that a whole lot of things that used to mean something to us has little or no meaning to us at all, unfortunately, because that is a key factor in, in the downfall of America and also in the downfall of us as true believers in the one who came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But unfortunately, a lot of the principles and standards and values that once made us the people who we are, are now being substituted for things that have no value and no standards and are creating just a pool of generations of us who are just falling by the wayside. One of those things is the honor of naming our children. The name of a child is a sacred ceremony. Uh, through scripture, and we don't have time to indulge into it now, but through scripture, it is an honored period where parents actually prayed and went before the self-created one, the great I am that I am, and they sought for days to find out what should my child's name be? Because a child's name already determined and declared for that child what their purpose and their function in life was. And they would try and live up to the meaning of their name. And so here we find, and some people sympathists try and uh, mix in this uh, historical blend that Nebuchadnezzar tried to give the Hebrews names that was similar to the names they already had. Well, if he was trying to create similarity, then why didn't he just leave their names as they were since he was trying to match them? But here we are. Daniel means God is my judge or God judges. Hananiah means beloved of the Lord. Mishael means who is as God. And Azariah means the Lord is my help. Now their names are changed. And then Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar gives him the name of Betasajor. Better Caesar, which means Baal's prince. Now, this Baal was the name of the Babylonian god that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. And then Hananiah, his name was changed from Shadrach, I mean, from changed from Hananiah to Shadrach. And this means illuminated by the sun god. So Hananiah's name no longer means the beloved of the Lord, but now it means illuminated by the sun God. And Mishael, whose name was changed to Meshach, they take the L out of the name, which is in Hebrew means God, and so they take the E-L out of the name and change it into Meshach. And now it means who is as God or who is like the goddess Venus, whom was the female or the god of fertility, which was worshipped uh, in Babylon. And then Azariah, Name is changed from Azariah to Abednego. So 
as we look at why is it necessary to change a person or an individual's name and how much impact is that supposed to have on a person's life because of course you can change my name but you can't change who I am internally but at the same time that does not negate although changing of my name I still know who I am but the changing of my name does not change the in the innate qualities that were given to me from God but it does at one point eliminate a practice which served a higher purpose and that is the naming of the children now sometimes we hear names either in public uh, uh, surroundings uh, we're at the theater we're at the grocery store we're out at a shopping mall or something and we may see uh, someone with some children and they, and they just look joyful and exciting and we one of them say oh you have some beautiful kids what is your child's name oh this right here this is Liz Shay Shay Liz, I call her Liz Shay Shay Labamba you know I like that name and I call her Liz Shay Shay and uh, his name is Jojo this is Liz Jojo and so, uh, so, you know, sometimes it's humorous to us that where do we derive these names from? Do they come from music that we're listening to? Is it something in a conversation that we, uh, someone said and we thought it was cute and we said, hey, that's what I'm going to name my next child. I'm going to call my next child Liz Shay Shay. But, uh, we we kind of have gotten away from certain significant factors which were a part of our culture. And while we're talking about our convictions and staying true to who we are and our commitment, then we also should look at how these things came across to those outside that they recognize that they have a certain severe or they have a certain high regard for the naming of themselves, their children, individuals. Names mean something to them. So we will take that part of their customs and their culture. We'll remove that and replace it with our own name. And we'll give them the accolades that we have attached to these names. So I hope that through the course of us unraveling uh, different uh, uh, significance out of the verses that we were looking at, I want to close with this one here. And that is, is that. It says that towards the end that they found the four Hebrews and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them and he found them to be 10 times better than his other magicians and astrologers and his other uh, agents that he would seek and servants that uh, were given these positions so that they would keep the king informed, uh, keep the king enlightened as to what was going on and how he should address certain issues. He found the four Hebrews to be 10 times better than all of those that he had in his own court serving him. So we close uh, by saying that the Hebrews were favored. They were favored and anointed by God. And no matter if they were serving in captivity or if they were serving in freedom, they exercised the gifts of God that were given to them. We hope that you have received something from this lesson and most importantly that in this year that something that was said 
will assist you in whatever endeavors that you choose to indulge yourself in that will be fitting and acceptable unto God to fulfill his will and purpose in your life that you would apply those things and that this will be a benefit to you. God bless you and God keep you.